This morning we are continuing in John's Gospel. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 20. But let me just uh, give you a um, heads up in advance. We are going to spend the bulk of our time in verse 12. And really just um, a, just a brief amount of time in, in those following uh, verses. What we want to focus on this morning is the fact that Jesus is the light of the world and what that means. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. May the Lord again bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, let me just remind you that last time uh, we saw the, uh, the woman who was caught in adultery. How Jesus extended his mercy to her without violating the law or God's justice. Uh, since all of her accusers basically were guilty of crimes that also deserve capital punishment, after Jesus said, you uh, who are without sin be the first to cast the stone, there was none left to condemn her or to carry out the sentence. And so basically, uh, she was off the hook with regard to the law of God. And because this woman also took hold of God's mercy through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus also forgave her of her crime. Jesus would bear her sin on the cross. Now we are reminded that Jesus will also show you this same mercy. The Father offers you this same mercy if you're only willing to leave your sin behind and come to him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things I didn't mention last week because I didn't really want it to get in the way of what we were looking at is that the earliest manuscripts you recall that uh, we have what are called autographs, or actually we don't have the autographs, at least we don't believe that we do. Those who are the, the original, uh, uh, what would you say, letters, gospels, penned by the writers themselves. What we have are manuscripts, our copies of the autographs. Uh, the earliest manuscripts that we have don't actually contain this account of the adulterous woman. I usually don't like to bring those things up because it makes us think, well, perhaps uh, this isn't an actual account. Maybe it shouldn't be here in the Bible. But this account does actually occur in later manuscripts, and some of them are, are relatively early. Uh, it occurs where we find it in our Bibles, here in, in John chapter 8. Sometimes it's found in other places in John's Gospel, and sometimes it actually shows up in the Gospel of Luke. But the church historically has believed that this story is authentic, that this really did happen, but scholars believe that it really originally was not in John's gospel. Now, there's a reason why I bring that up here, because if that is true, then what we read of this morning is actually taking place on the same day that we were looking at before this account, on the last day of the Feast of Booths, the same day that the water was poured out on the altar, the same day that Jesus invited all who were thirsty to come to him and to drink. Now again, you'll recall that this feast was meant to remind the Jews of God's mercies to them in the wilderness. 
The water was poured out, as it were, in this basin at the base of the altar to bring to their minds how God graciously provided for them water in the wilderness from the rock. But I also mentioned, I don't know if you remember this, but I mentioned there was also, during the time of the feast, the special candelabra which was lit in the temple. I believe it was in uh, the court of the women. And it was, I believe, the same as the treasury where Jesus is now speaking to remind them of this pillar of fire that the Lord used to lead them through the wilderness at night to give them light. Well, as Jesus pointed to the water as a picture of himself, of how he is the source of living water, of how if you're thirsty, you may come to him and he will give to you of his Holy Spirit to drink. You will have within you that well of water springing up. So now he points to the lamp as a picture of how he is the light of the world, how basically he is the only source of this light to the world. Now what I'd like us to do this morning is to consider two things from this text, and I told you the bulk of the message is going to be on the first point, which we find in verse 12. First, that Jesus is the light of the world, and what that means. But the second point is that you must believe that he is. You need to believe his testimony. You need to trust him in order to receive that light. So first of all, let's consider that Jesus is the light of the world. We read in verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them, again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now again, what does Jesus mean when he says that he is the light? Does he mean that he created the light, the lights that we see in the heavens, the light that we have, you know, basically lighting the day, or that he continues to give us light? Well, we do know that Jesus is the creator, and he is the one who did create light, and he's the one who continues to cause it to shine. But that's not what he's talking about here, of course. Not light in a physical sense, but rather metaphorically as a figure of speech. And we've already seen several ways in which light is used as a figure of speech and not in a literal way. What does Jesus mean here? Well, he means many things, but he means at least these four things. That Jesus is our only source of truth, that he is our only source of reason, of hope, and of life. Now, first of all, that he is the only source of truth. Uh, as in Scripture, light is characterized by truth, ignorance uh, is often characterized by darkness. So is basically our lives. Uh, ignorance is something that one, we, well, actually we come into the world being ignorant of many things, so in a certain sense we're in darkness. But in another sense, we come into the world predisposed toward and believing a lie. And that too is characterized by darkness. We read in Psalm 82, verses 1 through 5, uh, something of this symbol of darkness. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now, basically, he's characterizing darkness as not knowing. But we also need to recognize that God is basically indicting the rulers of his people, the judges of Israel, who knew that they should dispense justice to the weak and needy, that they should help them. But instead, they were making it possible for the wicked to oppress them. They knew what they should do. They knew the truth, but they chose to disregard the truth. They were basically lying to themselves about what they were really doing. Now, this reminds us that you can know the truth, but you can choose to walk in darkness. Basically, that's what the vast majority of mankind is doing. The vast majority of mankind knows uh, certain things to be true, certain things that have to do ultimately with where we came from 
and where it is we are going. But they choose to look at it in a way other than what is the truth, other than what God says in his word. And I'm thinking here mainly about evolutionary theory. You know, the Bible says that the revelation of God from nature is clear. And we all know that God exists, and we all know that we came from him. We also all have a conscience, and we know that we've sinned against him, and we know that we are guilty. But we choose, or I should say the vast majority of mankind chooses, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, to disregard that truth, to hide it out of their minds, and to continue to walk in darkness. So the vast majority of the world is in ignorance, and they are believing the lie. And as a matter of fact, that is the way we came into the world as well. That was our condition. But as over against this darkness of ignorance and this darkness of deception, Jesus is light. Jesus is the truth. That's one of the things that's wrapped up in this idea of Jesus being the Word or being the Logos of God. He is the revelation of God. He is the revelation of His truth. He is the one whose spirit, through, through uh, His spirit, gave us the Word of God so that what is written here is the very truth of God, the inerrant and infallible Word of God. Jesus prays in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus basically is light in the sense that he is the truth of God because this word is his word. He is the one who reveals that truth in his word that is most important to your soul. The only truth which is able to lead you to him. The one who is able to bring you to God, which is why Jesus basically tells us that he is the truth. He said to Thomas in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the truth. That's one of the senses in which he is the light. Now, I did say in this heading that I believe that Jesus is the source of all truth, not just spiritual truth, not just the Word of God, not just the Gospel, but I believe that he is, the, he is the source of every truth, everything that we have discovered in this world from the very beginning that actually is true. I believe Jesus is the author of it, and he is the one who has revealed it at the proper time to whom he wills. He is the light that shines in the darkness in a variety of ways, but most importantly, through the gospel. Now, secondly, Jesus is the light in the sense that he is the source, the only source of all reason. And reason, by reason, I mean the ability to see and to understand and to know the truth. He is the one who turns the light on in the mind. He is the one who gives us a mind to think with. I think this is at least one of the things that John means in where we read in John 1 verse 9 regarding Jesus. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. And when Solomon writes in Proverbs 29 verse 13, the poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both, by which I think he means not only the ability to see but also the ability to do something with what it is they do see in the light that is in the mind. Jesus, as the Creator, has given everyone, generally speaking, the ability to think, although the fall has you know, degraded that in a variety of ways, and some people actually do come, not being able to think because something is wrong with them. But as a part of our being made in the image of God, Jesus has given us light, as we've just seen, he's the one who gives us things to think about. Not the least of which is the evidence that he places everywhere in the creation for his existence. And this is another sense in which Jesus can be said to enlighten everyone coming into the world because he gives the light of reason and he gives the light of revelation in nature. He also, you know, of course, gives us the light of conscience in our souls, as I've already mentioned. He gives us evidence that is so clear that, as I've said, everyone is without excuse for their unbelief. But there is another sense in which Jesus gives the light of reason, and this one is absolutely essential to our salvation. 
and that is when He illumines the mind by His Holy Spirit, not only to understand the truth of what He says, but to see how beautiful it is, to see how desirable it is, so that we will really want that truth, really want to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, why is it that there are people walking around who have said, when you share the gospel with them, I've heard that before. I understand that. I know that God sent His Son and so forth. And I don't believe it. Or others would say, I, I know it, I understand it, and I believe it. But then you look at their lives, and they're no different than anyone else. They live like everyone else in the world. They chase after the world, and they don't love the Lord. What is the difference between you who love the Lord and are following Him and them? It is this light which the Lord gives that shows you the beauty of Jesus and the way of salvation in Jesus so that you want Jesus and you embrace him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 this very thing. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The one who said at the beginning, let there be light, and there was light, is also the one who shines this light, not just into the world, but into our hearts. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, the beauty of that glory, is what we see. Now, as I've said, this is the only difference between the believer and the unbeliever. It is the reason why, if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that you read the Word of God. You treasure the Word of God. You submit to the Word of God to His truth. It's the reason why you turned from your sins when Jesus was offered to you and why you received Him as your Lord and your Savior when so many don't do that. It's because Jesus shone the light of His Spirit into your heart and illumined your mind. And let me just say that if He hasn't done this, then all that's in your mind is darkness with regard to this kind of light. And Paul writes regarding those who refuse to acknowledge what they see of God in the creation, this, in Romans 1.21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. As long as the darkness is in your soul, this is what you're going to do with the truth. You need that illumination of the Holy Spirit and only Jesus can give it to you. So that's the second sense in which we say Jesus is the light. Well, thirdly, Jesus is the light in the sense that he is our only source of hope. Darkness is also used in Scripture as a symbol of despair. You know, things are dark. Things are looking dark. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. But light is used of hope. Now we read in Psalm 107, verses 10 through 14 here, the image of how darkness is used to refer to despair and those who are despairing. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their heart with labor, they stumbled and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Darkness is used as an image of despair and even of you know, one who's despairing even of life. Now our sin, our ignorance, our believing Satan's lie as we came into this world left us in a situation that was dark. Even though we didn't realize it, we had no hope coming into this world. But Jesus in the gospel gives us light. He gives us hope. When you trusted him, he took away all your sins. He gave you his perfect righteousness. And now you do have hope. You have the hope, the light, you know, that's it's really, really shining in your face right now, not even necessarily at the end of the tunnel. But you have a, a hope right now that on the day when you have to stand before him, he's not going to condemn you. You have the hope that when you die, you're not going to go to hell. You're going to go to heaven. 
and that one day you're also going to have a part in that new heavens and that new earth that the Lord is going to create when the curse of sin has been removed once and for all. You have that hope that things are going to work out well in the end, particularly when it's going to matter the most. You also have the hope that no matter what you have to face in this life, when you're moving from point A to point B, that the Lord is going to help you through it. Jesus, I believe, is light in that sense as well. The psalmist writes in Psalm 112, verse 4, Light arises in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and compassionate and righteous. David writes in Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When you're trusting Jesus Christ, you don't have to despair ever. You know that the Lord is basically going to be with you through every difficulty and work out everything well in the end. Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So Jesus is light in the sense that he gives hope, hope in what would otherwise be darkness, the darkness of judgment, and the darkness of even living in this world, not knowing that all the things you have to face, that they're not going to destroy you. I mean, you wouldn't know that. As far as you know, they all are because God hasn't made a promise to you if you haven't trusted him. He is good. He is gracious. He gives good things, good gifts to all his creatures. But this promise is only for those who actually trust him. Now, finally, Jesus is light in the sense that he is the only source of life. Uh, darkness is also symbolic of death. I think we just saw that in the passage I just, I just read, but here's another one, Psalm 88, verses 11 and 12. The psalmist says, Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be made known in the darkness and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? You see, we also came into this world in darkness in the sense that we were under the sentence of death when we were born into this world. Paul reminds us in Romans 5, verse 12, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We were already under the sentence of death. We were already in darkness in this way. But if you have trusted Jesus, Jesus has given to you life instead of death. Not only do you have the promise that one day when you die, and we all will still die physically because of the curse, that your body will one day be raised again to life. But you also have the promise that your soul will never die. Everyone who lives and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, will never die. As a matter of fact, this life, this eternal life the Lord gives is really a package, not just endless duration and not just blessedness, but everything that the Lord gives us through Jesus Christ is wrapped up in this idea of life. So the light of his truth, which is the gospel, and the enlightening work of his Holy Spirit in your soul, which is also a part of this package of salvation, which has brought you to receive his life, having trusted in Jesus, you will overcome death once and for all. You will have eternal life. You will have the light of life. You will have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, that Jesus takes the sting out of death. We no longer have to be afraid of it because we have the light of the hope that we're going to be with him. We are going to live forever. He says, in light of that, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Uh, death is not something the Christian has to fear. It's something really to look forward to because we will be with Jesus. Now all of this is true for you if you have trusted Jesus Christ. And all of this is true for you because God in his grace did not send Jesus just for the Jews. I mean remember he is the Messiah promised to his Jewish people. But that he sent him to be a light to the nations. A light he says to the whole world. Jesus says in verse 12, I am the light of 
the worlds. And so this, again, is meant for each nation under heaven. In a certain sense, it is meant for everyone. It's, it's offered indiscriminately to all people. Everyone may be given that invitation to come to Jesus and receive these blessings. But they are, it is more specifically, of course, for those who actually receive the Lord Jesus because you're still in darkness until you receive the light, until you trust in him. And that really brings us to the last point, which I said is going to be briefer than the first. To possess these things, to receive this light, you do have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to begin by believing what he says about himself because that now is called into question by the Pharisees who didn't believe. And let me just again read verses 13 through 20 and I'll just make a few comments about it. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And the reason why, of course, is because there need to be two witnesses, not just one. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but earlier in John's gospel, Jesus pointed to several witnesses to prove who he was, to prove that he was the Messiah. He pointed to John the Baptist and his testimony. He pointed to the works, the miracles that he did. He pointed to his father's testimony. He pointed to the Old Testament scriptures in general. He pointed to the testimony of Moses in particular. But now he points to his own testimony. And this, he says, was enough by itself to establish that he is who he is. And that's because of who he is. He was the one who knew where he came from. He was eternally with the Father. He knew where he was going. He was going to go back to be with the Father. The one, he is the one who is God himself. Now when it comes to men, to establish the truth of anything, you had to have at least two or three witnesses. But when it comes to the Son of God, one is enough. When the Son of God speaks and he says something, you know it's true. But Jesus pointed out again that he's not the only one who's testifying about himself. He wasn't alone in it. The Father has also given his testimony. How has he given his testimony? In all the ways we've just seen. He's the one who sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for Christ. He's the one who gave Jesus the ability to do these miracles. He's the one who spoke out of heaven at the baptism of Christ, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There was no question that Jesus was the Messiah, their Messiah. And you know what? The Jews, we've already established, already knew that that was true. And yet they continued to act as though it wasn't true. They asked Jesus, where is your father? You say your father bears testimony? Well, bring him along and we'll listen to him. Well, Jesus said that the fact that they were asking where his father was was the very evidence that they really did not know God at all. They didn't know him. Jesus tells us in his first, excuse me, John tells us in his first letter, you can't have the Father if you reject the Son. You can't have one without the other. The Jews can't be saved as long as they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because these Jews had neither the Father nor the Son, they were still in darkness. Jesus says, you should believe me, but you don't. You should believe my Father, but you don't. You should know who my Father is, but you don't. And it's because you're in the darkness of sin. You don't have the light of life in you. You're in darkness. You have to believe the testimony Jesus gives regarding himself. And you have to, believe, you have to trust him. 
So the question this passage asks you this morning, really asks all of us, but it asks you particularly who don't know Jesus, you know, where are you? Where are you with him? Do you believe what Jesus says about himself, that he is the light of the world? Do you believe that he is the way? Do you believe that he is the truth? Do you believe that he is the life? Do you believe what his father has said about him? through all these various ways? And have you received this light? Do you believe His Word? Has your mind been illumined by the Spirit of God so that you've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have the light of the hope of heaven? Do you possess eternal life? Now, how can you know whether you have or not? Well, it actually comes from verse 12 again, so we go back to verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How can you know whether or not you have the light of life? How can you know whether you've trusted Jesus? How can you know whether the Spirit of God has shown in your soul and you've actually trusted him? You can if you are following Jesus. That's the only way you can. So you need to ask yourself this question, is that what you're doing? Are you walking in his truth? And not just because, well, I've got to do this or I'm not going to go to heaven, so I'll try to make myself do this. No, that's not what the Bible says. That just works. But are you walking and following Jesus? Are you living according to his word? Are you following his example? Because that's what you want to do. Because you love him. And you want to honor him because the Spirit of God has illumined your mind and shown you the beauty of that way. And that's what you want. If that's true of you, then you do have the light of life. You do have Jesus Christ. You have savingly trusted in him. But if these things aren't true of you, then you're still in the dark. You need to turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that the Lord would send out his light and send out his truth by his Holy Spirit through the gospel to lead you savingly to him, to his holy hill, to Jesus Christ, to trust in him that you might be saved. Well, with that particular challenge, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to mercifully to speak to our hearts and to Shine that light if we don't have that light or if we do have that light to give us the grace to live up to that light and to follow him.